Uh, we have Elliot Noma here today. Elliot has been a, a regular at the UX and Data Meetup. <laughs> I'm going to say pretty much since the beginning. That's, that's correct. Really that since the beginning. So I'm really, I was so excited when you said to me a couple of months ago that you wanted to do a meetup and that you wanted to come talk to you about how to lie with charts. What a great topic. Everyone, let's get a, a nice round warm of applause for, our, for one of our own, <laughs> Elliot Noma. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Laria Batista and Kimberly Mitchell, who is also part of this group, for uh, talking with him earlier and developing, helping me develop some of the ideas. Again, I'm responsible for all mistakes, omissions, et cetera, et cetera. They only, only deserve credit. So what I wanted to do is I, th this actually was uh, originated in several different presentations that we had that I felt it was just really important for us to have sort of the alternative view. So we've had a lot of great graphics here. We've had a lot of great, great shows in terms of how to talk about data how to present it, state-of-the-art stuff. Um, but the feeling was that with great power comes great responsibility. So instead of seeing great graphics, you're going to see relatively lousy graphics. But the point is really that graphics can do a lot of damage. And I don't mean, I mean primarily to you. So actually, the way I'm going to start out the presentation is to talk about the issues that if you lie to yourself, because that's a lot of the, what you're doing if you misuse, the, misuse charts. So the, uh, I wanted to bring up one of the classic examples of what happens when you lie to yourself. This is uh, the Washington, D.C. Metro, 2009. There was an accident. Turned out that nine people died as a result of that. And the investigation afterwards was a classic case in terms of an organization lying to itself. There were, uh, there were supposed to be automatic shutoffs in which the trains would not run. If there was another train on the track, those were turned off or disabled or didn't work at all. You had issues in terms of whether the handbrake, which was the backup, worked or didn't work. That's unclear. There was management issues etc cetera, etc cetera. so example of you don't want to lie to yourself you're the main you're, you're the initial customer in terms of all your graphics so let's talk about something that's a little bit closer to home so let's say you have a startup and you're tracking what the cumulative usage is of it and I know I'm, gonna, I'm involved in a couple startups and this is the sort of thing I love I'd love to see this this is also called a vanity metric. And there's a reason for it, because it makes you feel good. You can, you can talk to your investors. You can show this thing. But what it does is, in many ways, it obscures a lot of the real events that are occurring inside of, inside of this history. So let's take a look at it another way. OK, well, actually, let me first, first say, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this business is a viral business. So the idea there is that every user goes talks, talks to their friend, and they have new users as a result of that. So it, it should be growing exponentially. And so you, it looks like that's the case. And everything's right on track. Now let's look at it a little bit differently. If we take it, put a log scale on it instead of a linear scale, we see that uh, the dashed line is what should be going on if the trend had continued, but it isn't. That's totally obscured by, your, by the previous graphic. So it does matter in terms of how you present things. And it turns out around, somewhere around period 20, there is an issue. And you need to look into, into exactly what that issue is. You want an even better way to look at it? You look at period over period. So what I've done is I've taken three different, three different graphs. It's all exactly the same data. But what I've done is I've shown it in different ways. The first way is the way that you convince yourself. You lie to yourself. Everybody's happy, but it's the wrong picture in terms of what's going on for this particular business model. So 
what I'm going to do is actually talk about a couple different ways to lie, lie to yourself. So what I've done is I've shown you, the, shown you the first way. Just drawing a picture and drawing a picture in, a, in such a way that it isn't telling you what it should be telling. Now there's a second way of doing this, which is omitting data or adding data or making choices in terms of what you're, do, what you're measuring or how you're measuring it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. And then the third one is really a little bit more subtle. It's the fact that when you make a picture of you're making certain decisions and you have, a, you have some ideas in your head. And the ideas affect the type of chart, how you interpret it, and you could, you could mislead yourself quite badly by going down certain roads on that. So let's, let's take a look at a, another simple chart. Can so, is, does anybody have a comment in terms of what this chart is showing and what its problems are? Yes. Aside from it being a 3D chart, which makes it difficult to read, it also starts at 5.175, which is going to really overemphasize the difference between the two bars. Exactly. That's, that's perfect. And uh, um, so that's one of, one of the issues. And it turns out, if you think about it, this is uh, unemployment data. It's eight years for both of them. This is a long period. There's a lot going on there. And yet you have a difference that's uh, two one hundredths of a percent, and it's made to made to look like it's really material. So obviously somebody has a political agenda in terms of what they're doing and how, how they're presenting it. So it's one of the one of the simpler ways. If you look at charts, um, there there's many of them that people say, well, there's a difference here, but then you have to remember, is the difference at all material? Now. These ideas aren't original to me. They're, uh, uh, this is one of the books I recommend. It's uh, you know, how, to, how to Lie with Statistics, a classic book first written in 1954. And one of the nice things about it is this is not written by a statistician. It turns out it's, it's probably the world's most popular statistics book in terms of the number of books sold. It's gone through multiple editions on, on this. The graphics are really primitive, but the points are really well, um, really well taken and well explained. So if you look over on the right-hand side, you have two ways of showing exactly the same, same piece of data. So the, the first one is emphasizing what the difference is. And the second one is emphasizing that they're all really pretty much similar. So you can sort of put yourself in the position, let's say you're, you're an economist and you want to make an argument on this. Why you would show one, one way or the other? So it's relatively easy to think about things, um, change the facts, and then if I put the sl slide, up, slide up very quickly, you would come, come to one conclusion or another conclusion. Now, let's take a, take a look at some of the, some of the data that's quote data that's actually in his book. So here he had uh, steel capacity in millions of tons, 1930s versus 1940s. So it's a standard bar chart. It's, uh, it's grounded at zero. Makes sense. Gives you a pretty good idea in terms of, in terms of what's going on, even though it's, there's not much data here. But the, the point is really that this is a reasonable representation in terms of what's happened in a, in a 10 year period, in terms of steel, steel production increasing. So in Huff's book, he presents this. And somebody tell me what the issues would be if I saw the graph on the right. Is it correct? Is it not correct? Anybody have any thoughts on that? So incorrect. It's, it used volume to give you periods so of length. That's, that's correct. So by, by putting up a, what we would think of as a three-dimensional object, our brains unconsciously think about it as a three-dimensional object. And we think, we know that as, if you 
go 40% on the height of the object, it's not 40% in ter terms of the volume. It's much, much more. So what's happened here is whoever put the chart, put these, the graphics up on the right-hand side, clearly wanted to overemphasize what the effect actually was during this, during this particular time period. Well, we don't need to actually even go back to being that elaborate. We have to be careful, even in the simplest things. And this is, uh, you know, I hate to admit it, I actually use Excel to generate these. But it's, it shows you that these are standard packages that everybody uses, and people don't think about it. So the issues over here is, is even though the bases of these are exactly the same, so it should be OK, we still think about that. There still is this residual thinking, saying it's really three dimensions versus one dimension. The other issue is that because we're in a three-dimensional plot, we're looking at it from a certain perspective. So I can manipulate this around and put a point of view so we're much, much closer to one of the, one of the pyramids than the other pyramid. So there's a lot of leeway that I have on this thing. This is just a little bit, but if I wanted to go crazy, I can definitely go crazy on this. The other thing also on this is that the different colors will look like different sizes. So you can change the color some things. And certain th colors also, uh, also transmit certain information. So if, you, if, you go to a, if, you, if you're driving your car and you go to an intersection, red means something, green means something. There's nothing, there's nothing magic about that. It's in our minds. There's nothing out there. But nevertheless, we could do the same sort of things. We can, put, we can put colors on there. We can put shading on this thing. I can shade these various ways. So one looks denser or heavier. The other one looks lighter. And naturally, that's going to affect how people think about it. So even with the bar charts, remember that colors, things like color, shading, etc. They do matter, and they will affect how you think about it. And then I can do the out and out sheet. Same thing you've seen before. I don't. I'm not. Uh, I'm not starting at zero. And so on and so forth. I can do this. There's a lot of there's a lot of charting charts and standard packages that it's very easy to do this and very easy to sort of say, well, it's a standard chart. I put the thing up. It's, it says, this is the range, range of the numbers and the y-axis. It automatically fits everything. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Just remember what the situation is. So now, now uh, so I've gone over some of the simple things in terms of what you can and can't, can do to mess yourself up in terms of the graphics. Well, there's another aspect to this of, well, let's say I have this, ha, have this data. I've, I've collected this, their consumer preference data. And so I use a standard uh, radar or spider chart, or you can call it something else. And uh, I'm trying to, trying to represent what the important aspects are of these various cars. So I look at it and I say, well, the dashboard's pretty similar, radio, there's this Wi-Fi. Uh, maybe the seats are better with the Ford. Maybe the color selection is better in the Ford. But the one thing that does jump out at me, the way I've represented this, is a level of acceleration. BMWs are known to have, have very strong engines that are able to accelerate very quickly, Fords or not. So, it sort of makes sense to what's going on. So the question then is, let's say that I want to show this, and I want to say, Ford has all the advantages. Anybody have any idea about how I could do this, other than just redo the survey? Any, other way, any, any way I could manipulate this? Okay, sure. I, I could I could put a put an objective thing in there. This is subjective. Okay, sure. Right, but then I, then I would then I would you would still have the same issue. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay, so obviously I can, there, there's a way of changing the data. I'll just take the inverse of the number. Anybody else? Any other thoughts about how I, how I could do this? Let's say my boss says, you have to get rid of this thing. Yes? That's right. Okay, so what I could do is I could color in the, in the central part and say, well, if I cut this out and weight this, then clearly the Ford is better than the BMW. And by, by, by coloring it in, what you've done is you implicitly said the area is what's important, not the individual aspects to it. Anybody else? Any other ideas on this thing? Yep. Perfect. That's, exa that's exactly what I did here. As I selected criteria that make it look a certain way. So maybe, I'm, uh, maybe I shouldn't have acceleration in there. Maybe mileage. Put mileage in there instead. So again, it's a question of, of what am I, it, it's, there, there's no objectivity here is the point I'm trying to make here. It's all subjective in terms of what I decide to measure and to some extent how, how I want to measure. Now, I have another trick up my sleeve in terms of what, what to do, uh, how, how to do this. What I want to do is I want to say, let's make acceleration less important. Figure out how we can, how we can make it so that even though the BMW is better at acceleration, it's not that much better. What? Sure, <laughs> you can put that in there. Uh, what I did is I protected, I, uh, I decided to do something, something specific. So what I did is I added another car in there. And the car happens to be a Lamborghini. Yeah. <laughs> so there is no contest, but you notice that what I did is I, I rescaled acceleration as a result of that. And suddenly, yes, the BMW does accelerate better, but not that much better. It's not even close to Lamborghini. So what I've done is I, I've biased that particular measurement. So what was a big difference is now not a difference. So it goes along again with the, with the which ones I've selected, but I've also said I can do other things. I can, keep, I can add other comparisons. Again, there's no objectivity here. It's a question about what do I, what is the reasonable thing I'm trying to look at? If somebody says, well, it's going to be family cars, whatever, I don't know whether BMW is in there or not, but it's something where I wouldn't put their Lamborghini in there. But you're making a decision on that to say, in this context, it's important or it's not important. OK, next thing. OK, so what we've done is we've gone over just out and out lying with your data. We've gone over things like deciding what to measure, what the comparisons are, who you're comparing against, and basically the context. And also, you know, what, what units you're measuring, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to do now is I want to say, well, there's, a, there's another aspect of this, which is by putting something up there on a graph or a chart, you're making certain assumptions about what's inside of your mind and how you want to organize the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare a tree structure, which I know has been much maligned in this world because, it, because it's restrictive, and talk a little bit about what those restrictions are and why they're there, why they're good, or why they can be bad. But first of all, let me, let me just talk about trees. So modeling data, the idea with the tree is you have a hierarchy. So it's, uh, if you're looking at a basketball tournament, it's you beat so-and-so, you beat so-and-so, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's always a way of thinking about it in terms of this is a coarser way of viewing it, this is a simpler way, this is a et cetera, et cetera. And you can, you can walk your way, way down the tree. The other thing about the tree is that it appears in many, many different ways. There's, uh, there's actually a book out there that talks about the history of, history of uh, tree diagrams. It runs back 800 years, at least. So, I mean, people have thought about this. They've used this, used this tool in multiple different ways. But 
frequently there's a reason why they're using this tool. So what I did is I, just to prove that you know, we can go back in history, um, these are from uh, uh, two illustrations that would have been, been shown to people during the 1200s. And uh, the one, uh, one on, the, on the left is, I don't read, it, read Latin, but that's supposedly vices. The one on the right is virtues. And you notice that the, uh, the branches are, on the, on the left-hand side, they're facing down because the vices are bad. And the ones on the right are facing up because the virtues are good. So it, uh, this has been used as a way to organize the data and think about the data. You can think about family trees. You can think about you can basketball tournaments. You can, it's pretty much, there's a lot of different ways, decision trees, et cetera, et cetera, that you can think about. I want to talk about one particular like type of, of tree that I especially like. It's used in genetics. It's also used in, as a way to organize data. So the idea here is what you want to do is you have a whole bunch of, bunch of data saying that, that uh, uh, cows are close to pigs and they're further away from earthworms, for instance. You want to have some way of organizing, organizing it so you can say, you, you can represent this. So there's a thing called a dendrogram, and what it does is it takes your data, you, you, you get a measure of similarity between each one of the pairs, and then you, you, you draw it as a tree. And the tree is going to be such where if two items are close together, they're somewhat similar. If, they, if they're in the same branches, that means they're sort of similar. And if they don't meet until the trunk, that means they're very dissimilar. So what it is, is I'm trying to impose a way of thinking about the world on my picture. So what I did is I, uh, I can take an example. And uh, so let's say I had, uh, I have a series of things that I measure, measure similarity on. Could be uh, people's perception, how, how frequently they they, they appear in movies, could be DNA, it could be whatever else. So does anybody have any ideas in terms of how, how you might want to think about this? What's it telling you? This Well, the, that, that actually says that those are pretty similar. Time frame? Yep, time frame. Obviously, T Rexes and Velociraptors, I, I don't see very many of them around these days, other than the movies. So clearly, that's an issue. And that, but they are similar in terms of both dinosaurs. They're, uh, but they are different from the other animals in this chart. So the uh, mouse cat dog, they're pretty similar. Goat zebra deer, they're similar. And then you have the large animals in there. I got a question. Yes. Um, I, all of it depends on the similarity metric. And that that's correct. Extremely subjective or strange. So that's one thing I see here. That's right. The other thing is it doesn't show descenders. So I do not see, well, I guess I do, we do have some descenders. So I do, do see some family groupings. But I, I guess for the larger collection, I would ex see more hierarchical. That's right. Yeah, then this is obviously a subset, so I, for for display purposes here. But uh, uh, clearly, this is the, it, it's it's something that you're right. It does make sense. It does make a difference in terms of what I measure. And also, as before, it matters in terms of what's included. If I put a whale in, in here, suddenly this picture starts changing in terms of what's very very similar similar to other things. So, but. The, I've made certain decisions on this based on what seems to be a reasonable set of, set of criteria and also what I've sort of told you about how the data were collected. This sort of, you, know, you can make an argument saying this is sort of reasonable because it's put in a tree and we know how trees work. Now let's say I did the same analysis, same data, ended up with this. Not impossible, 
but it clearly is represents something that you would say, huh? <laughs> or at least you would have to really think very hard. And if I collected data like this, uh, I would go back and look at my data collection to try to understand it. Or I would say, the people who, if I, if I got gestures from people, people, those people are real strange in terms of how they're thinking about things. But the point is that, that it is a model. It's not just let the data speak. You really are imposing something on there, even for this relatively simple model. Doesn't mean that this is right, that this is wrong and the previous one's right. But what it does say, say is that there is some, you're, you're, you're imposing some, your thought process on top of what you're seeing here. Now, what I want to do is I want to compare that against at least one of the other models that's popular. So we have network models, we have cord models, we have other, other types, types of models. And uh, so this is an example of a cord model. So what it is is you have the points around the, around the perimeter, and they are the size of the, of the pipe between any two, par, any two points indicates what the relationship actually is in there. Now, one of the main differences of this is that, that you're showing all the data. There's really no judgment taking place. So each one of these slices here, this would be like a row in a matrix. So this one here has got one, two, three, four rows. It's a four by four matrix. And it's trying to show the re relationship here. But the difference, the difference between this and the tree diagram is that, that the tree diagram actually has a model. You actually have a, have a point of view in terms of, in terms of why you're doing this. This one doesn't. There is a pattern hidden, hidden in here. Does anybody see the pattern? I didn't expect anybody to see the pattern. What it is, it turns out that what I've done is I've, uh, I've taken the diagonal on the, uh, the main diagonal on the matrix and I've increased the size. So in other words, the off diagonals are small. But because there's no model here, it's really hard to see what's going on. So it's some of these narrow pipes here. Those are going off diagonal to off diagonal. So the chord model is good, but you've got to think in terms of what's it really trying to show. Just because you put data up there doesn't prove anything, doesn't tell you anything. This is, like so, some of the chord models may be excellent in terms of what they show, but this one here clearly misses the data that are actually planted in the, planted in the matrix to drive this model. What? Um, yeah, that was, uh, um, it turns out that the way you interpret this is this whole unit here, that's one item. So the width of the slice determines the, uh, basically the, the row sum or the column sum. Yeah, that's true. There's no, there's no labels, or I put labels on there, it still really doesn't tell you, tell you a lot. But in the right circumstances, you could see something. For instance, you have certain parts of, the, uh, of your matrix that have large numbers, and are constant, there's a concentration of part of the matrix. Probably would show. You could use this. But just by doing this, if somebody says this is a general, general way of showing data, you're still making a decision in terms of what you want to see, what you're obscuring. And I've just picked a really bad case, which, which I've obscured a lot in terms of what's going on. But it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that you've made a decision in there. Same thing with these network diagrams where you have, you have a single point, a series of, series of connectors out there. It depends. If you're looking for key individuals, it's probably the right thing. But it also can bias, you also can bias yourself because there, there's always going to be key individuals in any, any network.
So again, just to, just to review, you could use uh, graphic images. You can again play with the numbers, play with the sample, uh, do other things, and then hiding in plain sight, that means you pick the wrong model, either intentionally or unintentionally. I guess the key point I wanna, wanna really make is that whenever I hear somebody say, let the data speak, my mind screams. This is a problem because you're always making a decision in terms of what you measure, how you measure, et cetera, et cetera, how you, how you display things, and even things like, like, like color, even size of the graphic really matter in terms of, in terms of its ability to communicate. And lastly, I wanna leave you with the, the one true pie diagram I've ever seen. <laughs> There's a statistic that I always see all the time, and it always bothers me, so I wanted to do a comment, mm -hmm. which is global warming. It's always talked about in terms of uh, adding one degree, they say adding one degree temperature to the planet. You know, we've seen one degree rise, or half a degree, or one degree. And what bothers me is that the statistic, explaining it that way, doesn't convey the meaning of climate change or climate warming. I mean, my idea is that it would be heat. Correct. It's a different measure, and the numbers are quite large. Right. I was wanting to comment because you see that as an example of, I don't know, maybe misleading, not purposely, or. Well, I think it's I think it's very selective in terms of in terms of what one degree actually means, because a lot of it is first of all you have you have variability on a year to year basis, and there, there's a lot of swings going on swings in that. So I always get a get a. Um, I'm always very interested when we have a, a few hot days in a row and somebody says, oh, global warming. We have another hurricane. It's global warming. Whatever, it's not, that's, <laughs> it's, it's viewed in such a micro, micro way. So first of all, there's a lot of variability. I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a good summary of what's going on. Yeah, but, but, but it's sort of misused in terms of how, how it's presented. The other, other thing is one degree is, one degree, it matters in terms of where, where, in, the, where in the globe it is, what the circumstances are. So, you know, I, um, you can believe or not believe in, believe in global warming, but it's, it's, it's hard to sort of put a lot of credence in the one degree. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm scale. Yeah, the scale. scale is wrong. Right. That's correct, yes. Right. But that's the problem with, with science education, I think, probably in the U.S. People don't, people don't understand you know, the, the true measures, let's say, of energy and, energy and heat. Well, if, you, if you've read the, uh, uh, some of the books in terms of startups, then you're right. It's a question about maybe you want to lie to the investors. But Maybe it's a good idea not to lie to yourself. And so that's the reason why I put the emphasis in terms of, in terms of what you do to yourself. Well, again, the, the, you know, the, at some sense, some point, you have to sort of say, you know, we're all sort of lying to ourselves in some ways. You know, everybody, everybody here expects to go on and become a big success and um, establish, the, establish a new idea that becomes a unicorn or you want to become, become chairman of the company or things like that. We all have these views in terms of what we want to we want to be and realistically speaking don't know whether that's true or not true but that's how we keep going so in some sense i'm sort of saying this may be going against human nature to not lie to yourself but at least be aware of what you're doing and and so you can say this is a situation where i want to lie to myself this is a situation where i don't dare lie to myself because you obviously don't want to be on the, on the receiving end of a runaway train. That's not good either. Yeah, I guess two things. One's uh, tied up in the, the global warming thing. One is that um, the measures of bars or line charts or anything that's, that's not too obfuscatory or whatever still doesn't show you what 
the confidence is that that number might change or that it's reliable. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking, um, so our, our visuals usually don't have anything that gives an idea of the, the figure or the merit of that thing, how much it's likely to change. That's one thought. The other opposing thought is startups and everybody else who are interested in innovations and singular things. So I guess you'd have to make the case that some other data that you're showing does apply in our case. A similar kind of startup or somebody else that we say is like us um, had this growth pattern over five or 10 years. Do you, do you, do you see the opposing thoughts? Well, I, I think that, that um, the question really is, what is the truth? And that's really hard to say. Because again, it just, just bear it in the idea that this is a similar company and its growth pattern was, was similar to the one that we see. Bearing in that is a whole raft of assumptions in terms of was, this, was it the same situation? Is it the company really that similar? Is the product really similar? Are the times similar? Do you have a similar number of early adapters? Et cetera, et cetera. It's all based upon this. So it's, yes, it's a reasonable way to look at it. Is it the only way? Probably not. There's not, there's not truth is multidimensional in a lot of the, lot of these. You know, going back to the, 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 the climate change, if I drew that in terms of Kelvin, one degree is nothing. It's, it says we're fine. <laughs> so it's, it, it, do we think that? No, we probably don't think that either. But what's the truth? What's the best way to show it? What's, what's really the, the point? I could also draw, draw that in such a way that I could, that the seas are gonna rise 200 feet in the next 100 years. I could do a projection like that too. Again, going back to your error bars. Probably a big error bar in that. But we still see those graphs that appear that says, this is the way it's going to occur. And so part of that is not only yourself, but when you look at graphs, ask yourself, what's, you know, what's the assumptions behind this thing? Are the assumptions reasonable? You know, what, uh, you know, what should I be thinking about? Is there an alternative way that I could, I could, I could roll this and see something different? How robust is it? Well, that's, that's a lot of it. How robust is, your, is the way you're thinking about it? Do the numbers back you up in multiple different ways and multiple different points of view? Uh, Elliot, just real quick, uh, you touched upon a philosophical issue. Are you, uh, are you positive? I mean, are you optimistic that the, I guess the, the, the ability to understand statistics is going gonna, is gonna to be beneficial for people as a whole or, or not? Just the explosion of quantified self, quantified everything. Um, even civic um, activist groups have access to political data that was not available to the general population before. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic in terms of what, what statistics can do. I'm also not pie in the sky. It's not going to solve, it's not going to solve everything. We're not, going to, we're not going to live forever based on just, just statistics. All the potholes in New York City will not disappear with better statistics. We're better at everything. So yes, but I think the other, the other thing also is that, that we're going to be bombarded by more and more numbers. So it really matters in terms of, in terms of our literacy of being able to understand the numbers, which gets greater and greater. So it's sort of a warning saying, not only are numbers good, but numbers and the way they're presented, they also open you up to a lot of charlatans talking about how you can present this, or how you can talk about that. And an educated person is probably the only defense against that. The thing is that you talk about lying to yourself. My experience has been that uh, either I, as a manager of a project, or I'm being somebody working for a manager in a project, is directed to make a graph that will sell that project. Correct. Sell an idea. It's not lying to yourself. You're purposely designing something that you know is misleading, but it's there because that's what you've been directed to do, or you have to direct it to do it. 
That's correct. I, I, I've been that's in that. That's, that's very common. Yes. So I think human nature is that's what we do. You know? Correct. So I, I, think, uh, I think what you said think is correct, that being educated is the only way to defend yourself uh, against that type of, uh, you know. Sure. I mean, I, I was in a position for, for a time as chief risk officer of a firm. And yes, I was ordered to do certain things. We don't the, 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 the point is that, that you also have to be able to step back and say, maybe my better judgment would do this. I may not show it to anybody, but I should be aware that myself that I'm not getting fooled by my, by my own press releases. Yeah, I see a lot of it, in, in, unfortunately, in the scientific Correct. Uh, reporting. There's a lot of false, uh, you know, this medicine has improved. Uh, you know, life by 30 you know, right. percent. So that instead of buying one month, mm -hmm. you're buying two months. And, you know, things like that. Well, I mean, also in the scientific community, there's there's a lot of incentives to go and go and put the best spin on things because it's grant money, it's tenure, it's you know other uh, other forms of advancement inside the scientific community. I was thinking about uh, creating your own charts, right? Uh, you know, if you know how to draw. Well, you charts. You can play with different things, grab different data. Uh, the power of the chart or the visual the visualization is to simplify the information so it's mm -hmm. easily grasped, which means you're thinking about less in some way. Yeah. So what you did at the beginning, when you compared different things, gave you a truer picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting to think about technology as enabling exploration through visualization. Right. Right. Allowing you to generate those three different graphs and mm -hmm. play with the parameters or with the information, such as uh, steel production in the 30s and 40s. <laughs> if I divide the steel production for the domestic use as opposed to wartime uh, right. uses, ships, and uh, mm -hmm. that, I might see a very different picture of what's happening, or uh, women with college degrees getting to see a position, right. and the number of women who are getting college degrees. And so it, it, that will change this. The, Slow. Mm -hmm. So, um, would you comment on whether technology is actually at the point of the people who are developing the, the technologies that are allowing us to visualize more easily? Are they building in the capability to explore, or are they uh, restricting even further our ability to explore? Well, I, I'm a big fan in terms of the in terms of the modern modern graphic graphic tools that are out there. I use them very extensively because they're, they're, many of them are interactive. Many of them allow you to cut up data, display data in a lot of different ways. So I'm a big fan of that. The, 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 probably the one aspect I'm not a big fan about is if somebody puts up a chord, di you know, a chord diagram and you have all the tools to manipulate all the, uh, all the order of everything. Then it just becomes a free-for-all. Anybody can go in there play with the dials to the heart's content, and we're all very good at finding, finding images in rock formations on Mars. It's very easy to do these sorts of, sorts of things, and it becomes something where it's, you're, you're, you're telling everybody that you now are able to have a chainsaw, and anybody can go out and cut anything they want with that chainsaw. It's something where again to it's something again to remember. I like the idea of releasing data, making it so that so that people can play with it. But the downside of that is that if you play with data long enough, or as the saying goes, if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess. And unfortunately, part of the, some of the confessions will be false. <laughs> so, but that that's sort of the issue. So again. You know, I, I like the graphics that have great power. You can do a lot of things. You can explore stuff. But again, it goes back to the analyst or whoever's doing the design. You have to understand what the, what the limitations are. And this also, you know, in some ways, you're also tying yourself to some of, this, some of the concepts in statistics. So in statistics, there's, there's a thing called the Bonferroni test. So if you know what a t-test is, or a test of significance, well, it says, this is a probability I could be wrong. But what the Bonferroni test says, if I do this once, okay, that's correct. If I do this twice, 
well, I've got to be a little more conservative. I do, do the thing 100,000 times, I should be very conservative. So what it's, what it's saying is that the more power I have to go and, go and test things out, the greater chance I'm just going to fall into something by accident. And the thing that's, that, um, about the charts is they are so powerful that you have to be aware of what you're doing or potentially doing. Uh, one of your earlier slides had a note to be sort of cautious about data that is actually models. Um, and could you sort of elaborate on that concern? So is it, a, is it uh, that people might not be aware of something they think is an objective fact, like if you have inflation, oh, that's the change in prices over some period of time, but then you, but then you dig in much deeper and you find, well, there's a sampling process to figure out which prices. There's a very complex weighting algorithm to choose the prices, and this is done to optimize like, some measure of change in GDP as a function of you know, interest rates available to money center banks for a short period. So what would like, elaborate on what the concern of using models or not being aware of having models? Well, I mean, one of the, one of the classic ways that, you could, that, that models are misused in the economic area is that if you say, say, we're going to compare the price of price of broomsticks now versus the price of broomsticks in 1930. In other words, you have to make these adjustments. You have to understand your data to basically be able to able to use them correctly. So I think that's what you're getting at. And so you so so there's a there's an understanding. It's not just blindly sticking numbers in in place. You really ultimately Need to need to go and look at your data underneath. Now, again, this is part of the reason why I like like the modern interactive graphics, because what I can do is I can drill in a certain way, and start thinking about it, and then I'll say the first reaction is, well, what have I done wrong? What have I missed? Why do I see this effect? And it could just be because the dollar is worth a lot less than you than it was 50 years ago or that uh, there's certain things the Federal Reserve has done, certain actions it's done, or international, international shipping is a lot cheaper, so therefore you have other things. So I think charts used co correctly, they are just a tool. They shouldn't be an end. So they should, go, they should be paired with two things always. One is understand your data. Try to figure out what its deficiencies are, what it's good for, what it's bad for, what, 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 what it's inappropriate for. And number two, if you're going to, going to do something like um, do a test and say, well, this is a much bigger thing than that, you have to go back to the unemployment numbers. What's your confidence bands? What sort of statistics are you using to get to that point? Because Unemployment is really bad. I hate, the, I hate the numbers that are coming out. And you probably do this, well, the same because they're just counting the people that, that applied for unemployment. There's all these people that said, oh, I'm not going to get a job anyway. I'm not going to apply. Or I'm too old. Or I'm just going to be traveling. Or whatever else. There's a, there's a lot of deficiencies in that data. It's not just a number. So there's a, there, there's a variety of things hidden back in there. The other thing also, also I think is one of my favorites is the, is the fact, which again is like the confidence intervals, of somebody says, well, people like yellow phones more than they like blue phones or something like that. And you look at the data, the data is really, really noisy. If I, ran, if, I, if I ran another sample, it'd be the other way around or whatever else. And so it's charts or just another Way for way to help you think about stuff. Autism and vaccines, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. A great example because it plays on fear. It yep. ends up having terrible public policy, and people die as a result of something which, data-wise, looks very convincing, but really yep. is just a correlation. There. Right. I mean, that, that's actually an excellent point. That that one of the the, the that uh, you can never mix up causality and correlation. <laughs> done all the time, and unfortunately the problem is 
It's buried inside of us. We're designed to think that way. But you need to be sort of on the, on the outside looking in. So it's something where I'm always saying, step outside of yourself on this thing. If, you, if the boss says, go generate this graph, at least understand the, viol the, the violence you're doing to the concepts or the data and say, oh, by the way, <laughs> after the meeting, here's what's really going on. Don't get fooled by it. Remember your, remember your biases on that. One of, the, one of the things also in the graph, showing the charts was, we tend to think about anything that looks like a three-dimensional object, we just code it. We can't do anything about it. It's, it, it's in our brains, it's hardwired. I, I, you know, if, if anybody sort of has seen, knows what optical illusions are. Again, a great example of how we are hardwired to think certain ways. But you have to sort of step away. Think about it, think about who your artist is, think about what you're doing yourself, and think about your own biases, and also limit, limitations on data. I mean, we, when, we, when we decide we're going to measure something, we've made a decision saying that that something means something. And we should be doing it. Otherwise, why do it? If you're, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're talking to potential customers, then the question is, well, why am I talking to 10 potential customers versus 100 versus 10,000? You're making decisions as far as what's good enough or what's adequate. Just to remember that. Hello. I'm uh, just wondering, um, have you seen any um, interesting or useful lies we can make with uh, animated charts or interactive graphics? Um, that's actually a good question. I really haven't explored that on that. But again, sort of the animation charts, if you animate them, you probably can go th cycle through long enough. And I, that's, again, something also we are very hardwired. So for instance, if th there was, uh, uh, the, there's this thing called subliminal suggestion. So what, what it was is uh, they used to run have movies in which if you had a theater, they would have a little slice in there that says popcorn, or shows you, you know, a box of popcorn or some candy. And then they, they discovered that you run the movie, nobody's aware that that's going on in there. But it turns out candy and popcorn sales go up as a result of this. So. I need, I need to put those in my, uh, my charts. Yes, yeah, OK. <laughs> the, the one that says, give me a raise. I deserve a raise, <laughs> but it, so so I'm, we're 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 well attuned to things that consciously we don't even see. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if the an animation has a lot of opportunity, but also potentially a lot a lot of downside as a result. But I think it's a, I think it's a great question. I think it's a I, I think it's an excellent sort of thing to thing to explore, especially with virtual reality coming around. Might be might be a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, so you used one, I think, very important word, uh, literacy, data literacy. Right. So many people, they are data illiterate. They kind of can look at the charts, they can draw charts, they can make conclusions out of charts, but they don't know about basic terms like, I don't know, first derivative, yeah. The, yep. Basically the first chart you have shown. Right. Uh, and I mean, I, I think it's very important that all people now start to learn data. Uh, like 1,000 years ago, nobody needed to read to live their life. But now everybody needs to read. And maybe now we all need to start learning how to work with data. I mean, even kids in a school. Right, I, th I think the idea of having people understand the power of graphics is, is actually something that's, that's very important and it's actually underestimated in terms of the power of, of putting, a, putting a sign up and says, this is this, you know, I, I, um, um, we're, we're definitely wired to look at a visual image and remember that a lot better than we do a series of words or something that somebody spoke, has spoken to us. And unfortunately, a lot of the advertisers know this um, YouTube, they know it really well. Anybody, anybody who's in the visual arts, 
knows this very well. But there's sort of another part to it, besides the, besides the power of it, is sort of saying, what can the power do for good or for bad? I mean, the, the things the, the, it can be, it, it can be useful and can be good. I mean, if you, if you look at just the simple thing like what, you know, what street signs look like. I can pretty much go to any part in the world and if I see a, you know, a, if I see a red sign of a certain shape, it's a stop sign, regardless of what the language it's in. These are, you know, we, we develop these very, very strong archetypes that we can use. It is a language out there. What I'm concerned about is the misuse of the language and the fact that frequently people are unaware that the language can be misused. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. We tapped all the questions. Elliot, let's get a, let's get a warm round of applause for Elliot. Thank you, everybody. So thanks for coming out tonight. We'll see you again next month. Bye-bye.